It's called Remainder of Chapter 30 Notes. So that's the one that you're going to grab. Uh, if you open it up, it looks like this. All right. Um, we're going to skip over the first part. The first part used to be in the old McKay textbook, and it was dealing with American civil rights. I don't know why they chose to do American civil rights, but so I just kind of went through a little bit of the process with them on that. Uh, it should be stuff that you remember from U.S. history. I don't know why they would test it in European history, and I'm pretty sure they won't. Uh, so we'll skip over it. If you're interested in that stuff, you know, certainly ask. Um, the next section that we're going to look at, though, is actually starts on page 937 of McKay, and it's called Soviet Eastern Europe. And so what it is is kind of a snapshot of looking at the Soviet Union as well as Eastern Europe between 1945 and about 1968. Okay? Um, <clears throat> If you guys remember the heavy metal like Stalin thing that we watched, you remember that the last thing that we talked about was the doctor's plot. And that was Stalin after World War II, when they won the freaking war, and everybody was like, oh, you know, maybe like Stalin will lighten up now. And we won't have to worry about five-year plans and purges and all of those things. Well, Stalin gave him another set of five-year plans. And then went about this idea that like the doctors were plotting the overthrow of the government and was going to weed those guys out but died before he had a chance. All right. Um, the other thing was we know exactly what the plan, the game plan was for Eastern Europe, and that was part of the Cold War, but that he was going to take a hard line and that all of these Eastern European countries were going to have to take a hard line. And so free elections became sort of a sham. The Soviet army was sort of there to make sure that those elections were going to go Moscow's way. And so, um, for the most part, the Polans, the Romanias, the Bulgarias, the Albanias, they were all taking the line, meaning that they were, you know, I guess, pretty smooth transitions to a more Stalinist type of government. There are two exceptions to this. One of them is in Czechoslovakia, where I told you that the Czechoslovakians were not jacked about the idea of becoming stooges or puppets of Moscow right after they got done being stooges or puppets of Hitler to be able to turn around and then have that happen to them again right after World War II. They weren't really down for it, so Stalin had to make them down for it and brought in tens of thousands of Soviet troops and tanks to make sure that any uprising against the governments that they wanted to create um, were going to be put down with extreme prejudice. That was the thing that, remember, spiraled the United States and its, its allies to consolidate their zones of Western, the Western sectors of Germany together into West Germany, which begat the Berlin blockade, which begat the Berlin airlift, which begat the creation of East Germany, which begat the creation of NATO, which begat the creation of the Warsaw Pact. All of that spiraled off of Czechoslovakia. The other thing was that there was one communist country that would not line up, and that was Yugoslavia. Now, Yugoslavia was a communist country, but it was not going to be a Soviet-directed communist country. And the guy that took over in Yugoslavia was a guy named Josip, J-O-S-I-P, Tito. That's, I guess that's how you say Joey, you know, from that... Uh, Serbia or wherever the hell. Actually, he wasn't from Serbia. He was from Croatia. He was Croatian. But Yugoslavia, remember, is an amalgam of a lot of different places. Tito then becomes an opportunity, all right, because he's a communist, but the United States is like, you know, maybe not all communists are the same. And maybe we will look at him as being an opportunity that we can forge some alliances with people that aren't under the Soviet or orbit. Because Yugoslavia was like, look, we aren't like everybody else in Eastern Europe. We fought off the Nazis by ourselves. We didn't have the Soviet army liberate us, so they're not going to tell us what to do now. So they kind of, I guess Tito was sort of like my own man kind of communist. And that's sort of how it played out, at least for the next, you know, four decades or whatever. After Tito and after hardline communism in Yugoslavia, it goes to hell in a handbasket after 1989. We'll talk about that probably after spring break. Um, let's look at 
the Soviets real quick on this one, though. Um, Stalin, mercifully, I guess you would say, dies in 1953. You know, when you are when listed as number three, I guess it is, and the all-time worst people in world history, people probably need a reprieve from that. Okay, and if you put up his death tolls and everything that he did, it was going to take a long time for the Soviet Union to recover from him. Okay, the guy that takes over was one of the you know loyal subjects or loyal servants. Uh, to Stalin's regime, and that was Nikita Khrushchev, okay? Kind of an old, hard blind kind of dude. Um, and what kind of shocked people about Khrushchev is that he stepped up and had a meeting with all of the communists. It was called the 20th Party Congress, and they met, and he gave a speech that kind of like shocked people a little bit because he was like, Stalin was a bad dude, he committed atrocities against our people, and we need to kind of give up that cult of personality thing now, and we need to start doing right. And so there was a program called de-Stalinization. They started to take down his posters and his statues and all of that stuff, and they kind of fessed up to the fact that Stalin was guilty of a lot of crimes against humanity. All right? He wanted to, to lighten the load on the Russian peasants, so they did this thing called the Virgin Lands Program. It was to start appropriating and put more lands under cultivation, but hopefully that that would be net beneficial uh, for the people. Um, the other thing was that he tacked in foreign policy towards what he called the doctrine of peaceful coexistence. And he lightened up, and in fact the Eastern European countries in general lightened up on the cultural control that they had over the hearts and minds of the people. All right. And you can read about that. There's, there's movements that were going on in Poland. There was movements that were going on in East Germany. There was a couple of writers um, in Soviet Union. One was Boris Pasternak, who wrote Dr. Zhivago. The other was a guy named Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who wrote very, very critically of the Soviet Union. There's a work called A Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, and there's another work called Gulag Archipelago, which were, or Pelago, potato, potato. <laughs> These works are basically telling about Stalin's crimes and what it was like to be in the Soviet Union in the 20s and 30s. Um, and it kind of like, it, it almost got out of control. Uh, that, remember, the idea is, is that you have the reform, reactionary, rebellion type of scenario in Russia, and it's really no different, okay? If the reactionary is Stalin, then the reformer is kind of Khrushchev. But once the reforms tend to go awry, then what happens in Russian history? Okay, and that's what happened, okay? The people then themselves started to get a little bit of breath of freedom and they wanted to run with it. And the critiques and the cultural kind of like easing became a little bit more critical. And he's like, uh-oh, I kind of let the cat out of the bag. And then this doctrine of peaceful coexistence, it's almost like the Eastern European countries are like, is this for real? This guy ain't Stalin. Maybe he's going to allow us to be kind of our own people. And so in 1956, there were a couple of uprisings. One of them was in Poland. It was led by a guy named Gamolka. And then there was one in Hungary. Uh, and this name is actually pronounced Imre Naj, but it looks like Imre Nagy. Uh, but there was a there was movements in Hungary and Poland that were kind of saying, look, we want to kind of break ourselves from this yoke, you know, that is controlled by Moscow, and maybe put like a little bit of humanity to our, our version of communism or socialism. And Poland happened, and remember, Poland was kind of like defiantly, did not want to be part of Soviet, you know, directed whatever. Poland's been through some stuff, guys. Poland has more PTSD than any Eastern European country, maybe any European country. Remember, Poland didn't exist, then it re-existed, then it didn't exist again, then it re-existed, and then it functionally became part of the Soviet Union. All right? They're pissed. All right? They're also Catholic, and they really didn't dig the whole Marxist thing that much. All right? So it's almost like Khrushchev kind of said, okay, Poland, we get it. You're Catholic, and you hate us, and all of that. So um, you can do your own thing, but you guys are communists, and we are keeping our eyes on you. 
And then Hungary did it, and then Khrushchev's like, uh-oh, I know what this is going to be. It's going to be like domino effect, right? except the other way. And so when Hungary had their uprising, the Soviets put about 500,000 troops into Hungary and said, get your asses back in the line. And then he got grumpy. Then because there was uprisings that were going on in East Berlin, remember I told you, there's like three and a half million people that were using East Berlin into West Berlin as like a gateway to get the hell out of Eastern Europe. And Khrushchev was like, this is not good. It's making us look very bad. There are riots going on in East Berlin. Okay, remember that what that was all about. And how did it get, how did it end? Berlin. Clark. Remember that they got to a place where, where Khrushchev was ready to like occupy Berlin proper. And Kennedy like went and gave a speech and said, Ich bin ein Berliner, or whatever the hell it is. And like all the Berliners were cheering. And basically what Kennedy was saying, I'm drawing a line in the sand, we're not giving up West Berlin. And Khrushchev said, fine, we'll build a wall. And Kennedy's like, well, that sort of sucks, but whatever. And it kind of became that. All right. Um, so you got the Berlin Wall. You also got a crackdown on all these Soviet intellectuals that were writing disparaging works about living under the Soviet Union. Uh, it was a physicist by the name of Andrei Sakharov. It was two literary figures, Pasternak and Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And Boris Pasternak won uh, a Nobel Prize for literature for Dr. Zhivago, and they wouldn't leave, let him leave the country because they were fearful that if he left the country, he would not come back, and then he would be like out there broadcasting what it's like to live in the Soviet Union, all right? Then you had deteriorations with the U.S., you had the Cuban Missile Crisis, you had the build up, build up of the nuclear arsenals, and then Khrushchev got thrown out of office, because after the Cuban Missile Crisis and everything that went down, all of the hardline communists were like, this guy's too weak, and they kind of put him under house arrest, and he was replaced by this guy that I call the Brow, Leonid Brezhnev. And there's a picture of the Brow. If you look in McKay, there, there's this really like weird thing that happens called the kitchen debates, where Nikita Khrushchev and Nixon are having debates about which is a better society by comparing kitchens and looking at like all the appliances and all of the things that the United States had, like state-of-the-art ovens and dishwashers and all of this other stuff. And they're talking about, you know, like gadgets and consumption and whether those things are good or bad things. And Khrushchev's trying to say, you know, our people can afford a $14,000 home. And it's like this like weird, weird ass thing that happens where Khrushchev and Nixon are having a debate about which society is more advanced. And it was kind of civil and it had a lot of I don't know, publicity, but it was also really odd considering the time period. But it was during that period of peaceful coexistence where they were having these conversations. That's before you had like Soviet people like taking their shoes off and smacking them on the table at the United Nations building and stuff like that. Okay, then what I did here was we just went down the line and looking at the Eastern European countries, and I wanted you to be familiar with sort of their story. Um, Hungary, I told you before, there was an uprising led by this guy named Imre Naj that was supposed to be like at least liberalizing their form of communism, and it was crushed. And the Soviets put their puppet in place, and his name was Janus uh, Kader, K-A-D-E-R. And the Czechoslovakia, uh, remember, they, they were smacked around in 1948. They took another crack at it in 1968, and it's part of a like a phenomenon, if you will, in 1968, where they had revolutions in a variety of different places, and they all got beaten back by conservatives. So the Soviets came in and crushed another uprising in Czechoslovakia in 1968. It was called Prague Spring, and they replaced it with hardline communists, and then the Czechoslovakians had to wait another 21 years before they could take another crack at it. Um, Poland had Gomolka. Um, and remember that the Catholic Church is going to play an influence. In fact, um, it is a pole that ultimately kind of becomes a fixture in, in the movements in Eastern Europe uh, away from communism, and that pole uh, became Pope John Paul II. Romania had a Stalin, for all practical purposes. His name was Nikolai Krzyzewski, and he was pretty hardcore. 
and we'll talk about him later. I told you that Yugoslavia is sort of like the one that got away, and that's Joseph Tito. Bulgaria had a figure named Todor Zipkov. Bulgaria and Albania were very kind of loyal, hardline communists throughout the course of the Cold War, so really up until 1989. All right? Okay, next section then is talking about what they call big science. Is anybody familiar with this concept? It's like industrial science corporations, right? It's taking a collision, if you will, between universities and research grants, defense departments, corporations and government that are kind of all coming together for really big projects. And the example that they gave was like the Manhattan Project, where you kind of took these technicians and technocrats and scientists, you took government funding, you took research grants, you took corporations, and you kind of put it all together in one big thing. And you develop these really, really big kind of organizations. Like one of them was like, it's called the CERN or CERN, which is a European version of kind of like what NASA is and some of those big, you know, where all of the scientists and technicians come together in these big sort of functional departments. And that's sort of what it was about. They looked at what defense industries became during World War II, um, what, where they were taking the best of the engineers and the best of the scientists, and then there was kind of a relationship uh, that eventually becomes what's known as the military-industrial complex. But that's what it was. Um, that the World War II people then quickly cycled into what was necessary to get the advanced aircraft, the advanced technology, the advanced uh, information systems, and all of those things and that the Cold War environment provided a lot of jobs for a lot of those folks, all right? Whether it was space race stuff or whether it was um, defense industries, but it really, really built up, you know, scientific advance. Then the other part of it was this thing called the consumer or the gadget revolutions. And uh, they weren't even talking about the numbers. Like there was like, I forget what it was, something like, five or six million cars in operation uh, in Europe um, and like immediately after World War II and then it had gone to like 45 or 50 million in the space of about five to seven years. So, and then it was like all of the appliances and all of those things and that was the United States way of, uh, and, and I guess the West way of trying to equalize everything by saying like everybody will be able to afford these things. And so they got mass produced. And it really kind of changed the dynamic of, of what capitalism was. And it seemed like the elites that used to like have monopoly over certain things, now everybody had them. You could get people into affordable homes. You could get them televisions. You could get them radios. You could get them you know, uh, dishwashers. You could get them microwave ovens or whatever it was. That is feeding a gigantic industry that is based on the consumer patterns of people. And it also talked about the baby boomers. Because the baby boomers were not just the United States, where all the American sailors and soldiers came back and, you know, reproduced in dramatic numbers. But it was also happening in Europe. And then those people kind of came to, I don't know, I guess maturity or whatever in the late 50s and early 60s. And now you had a gigantic market for those people. Right? But then they talked about a few other things here. Um, Applied science where like computer technology, nuclear technology, advances in medicine, genetics, and all of those things kind of came into play. And then the other was that because the United States was so gigantic uh, in industry and science and technology after World War II, they had concerns about what they called the brain drain. Has anybody ever heard of that before? Or Americanization, which where the idea was that like it's very difficult for Europe to be able to hold on to its cultures because America and its consumption and its production seems to dominate almost every nook and cranny of everything that's going on in the world. Okay? Um, the double helix. Does anybody ever heard of like Crick, Crick and Watson? Yeah, what's that? And they were I mean the story that they used there is the, just the the amount of like these teams of scientists. <laughs> what did I miss? Easy, Yeah, that's fine. 
Um, <laughs> so the double helix is about this competition, okay? And where it's like pharmaceutical companies, or it's like defense contractors, or whatever, and like how, like intellectual property, where if like you come up with a discovery, or you invent a drug, or you invent something that is going to change the dynamic of the way this, you know, system runs, or this system runs, and like how what Microsoft and Apple are always kind of like one-upping each other. He's talking about the competition that exists between these scientists and technicians and how concerned he was because remember they had discovered DNA. I mean that's the genetic code or whatever the hell you want to call it and talked about how you know much infiltration of different teams of scientists and other things there was and how one could finally arrive at that. And so that's really what the double helix was about. Um, it was, you know, part of this thing called big science, but obviously from 1945 on, science and technology just went, and now it's, I mean, everything is on your phone, right? So what's been done in the last three years is equal or more than what was done in the previous 25 okay. years that's in terms of innovations. So that's kind of what it is, all right? Um, Responses to mass consumption and mass technology and all of those other things, massive industrialization. There is one like neat thing that comes out of it, and it's the re rise of environmentalism. All right, and this started. It was part of the United States, but it also became a really big thing in the early 1970s uh, in Europe. Was the rise of what they call green parties. And we've got one too. They don't pull a lot of votes. But there was at least the beginning of the movement that, hey, maybe this mad scramble towards consumption and industrialization and everything else is having an impact on the economy, or on the environment, rather. Okay? Um, the other thing that they're going to talk about in the reading a little bit is this thing called youth and counterculture. All right? And it's, I mean, you've heard of hippies and beatniks and all of those people from U.S. history. And certainly, Britain had their <laughs> What? What am I missing? <laughs> huh? <laughs> you may want to elaborate. This is going on YouTube. <laughs> okay, no context. Seriously. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> our, uh, our hipsters included in, like, that class <laughs> of counterculture. All right, whatever. Yeah. Wait, I have a serious question. Really? Okay. Um, my I've been sitting here for the last fifteen minutes, and like the notes will not open. Yeah. <laughs> like I've been sitting here trying to like get it, and then so I like whispered to Phyllis to email it, you know, but my email yeah, won't connect either. Wait, this so open up the yeah, 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 I did. No, after like a certain like, time, like yeah, go to the internet and log in. Yeah, because yeah. after a certain yeah. time at school, I just log in. All right, let's get back on topic. <laughs> All right. So anyway, there's a section. There's a section in the in the chapter. It starts on the next. It's actually the next chapter, which I guess is now chapter thirty, uh, called the growing counterculture movement, and that starts on page nine sixty three, and ultimately it builds, and it has like this apex, which is the nineteen sixty eight revolutions, but it was built on. A handful of things that were going down in different places. All right, one, it was maybe the ease that was taking place in the 50s and 60s in some of these Euro Eastern European states, like Czechoslovakia in particular, uh, where some of the students are now like, a little bummed about the fact that maybe the promise of whatever communism was supposed to be is not providing any dividends, and they're looking for liberalization and they're looking for freedoms and that sort of thing. The other part of it was that you had this huge generation of youth in the United States that were born into peace and prosperity, all right? And it created a real sort of rebellious uh, countercultural attitude, you know? And the thing about it is, is that a lot of people, and I, I, it almost makes me sound like a conservative, but the hippies were a bunch of spoiled brats. They really were. Um, they didn't 
they didn't have to fight, they didn't have to sacrifice, they um, had material goods, and the only people that are going to reject material goods are generally people that have had material goods. You know, if you're looking for a job or if you're unemployed or if your family doesn't really come from wealth, then you're not really concerning yourself with like aesthetic withdrawals and hippie communes and taking up causes and shit like that. OK, they didn't do that. OK, but in the 50s and 60s, you had kids that kind of grew up in all of the comforts that came in the post-war era. And obviously, yes. Uh, there was a lot of crappy things that the government was doing, and there were movements, and there were things that they noticed. But a lot of it was just like kids rebelling for no reason. All right? Um, what eventually happened, though, was that those rebellions became organized, and then they had reason. And in the United States, there was like a threefold thing that was going on that was kind of cool. One of them was that the countercultural movement started to embrace like real politics so rather than just being a bunch of dudes that like put on leather jackets and rode motorcycles and look up to James Dean and smoke cigarettes and you know had you know drag races and crap like that that they actually kind of became aware of what was taking place in the world and there were three things in the US that were interesting one of them was that there was a formidable women's rights movement that was starting to take hold in the 1960s. There was a massive civil rights movement that was going on that became really, really um, dynamic in the 1960s. And then you had the Vietnam War protests. So like youth that were coming of age and starting to enter college were doing it at a time when there were three really big revolutions for them to be able to embrace and then do something with. And the fact of the matter is, is that Vietnam was going crappy. There have been three major assassinations between 1963 and 68. The war was going bad. The civil rights movement had become a little bit more militant. The women, women's rights movement was growing a little bit more militant and making big demands. And it all kind of came to a head in 1968. Okay? At the same time that that was going on, there was also a movement that was going on in Paris that was based on the fact that there were more and more kids that were enrolling into universities. Okay? And part of it was um, this movement that started in the universities of Nanterre and Sorbonne were based on the idea that like colleges themselves had become almost like factories. All right? They called them factories of privilege or whatever you want to call it, but it was almost like it was like a rubber stamp kind of education. And it kind of built up with a working class movement that was kind of filled with unemployment and typical things. But student protesters started to take over like university buildings, making demands on the kind of education that they were getting. And it all kind of came to a head in 1968. Then you moved to Czechoslovakia and you had a similar thing that was happening where the youth were starting to get aware of what hardline communism was and movements that they were trying to do to, to depart from that hard line. And it was called Prox Spring, and it was led by this intellectual named Alexander Dubček. And it was, the, the mantra that they took on was called socialism with a human face. And what that meant was that they wanted to liberalize it, um, they wanted to start, you know, opening up, you know, cultural freedoms and things like that. And they wanted Czechoslovakia to be able to find its own way and kind of define communism in its own way. And the Soviets weren't having it. Okay? So what you ended up with was literally like a duplication of the 1848 revolutions in 1968. Because every single one of them started out with like movements that seemed to be energized and they were definitely like railing against the conservative order. Whether it was Charles de Gaulle or whether it was the way that education was being done in, in, in France or whether it was against hardline communism and the conservative governments of uh, Leonid Brezhnev who was then running Russia or the Soviet Union or whether it was against you know the governments that were uh, you know going after civil rights protesters or the governments that were funding this terrible Vietnam War or whatever the case was. And every single one of those movements failed. All right? 
The Paris uprising ended because the workers ultimately separated from the students, and Charles de Gaulle kind of came in and squashed those protests. Czech and Prague Spring ended up going really bad too. All right, where the Soviet troops came in and absolutely beat down the Prague Spring uprising and restored hardline communism. And then the United States. Hello. Hello. Hi. Pizza. Yeah. Where is Ariana? Okay, Ariana got it. All right. So last, last thing, and then we're going to stop for a minute, okay? We'll have our pizza. Um, so then the last thing was um, that Nixon kind of took over in 1968, which means, you know, four more years of Vietnam War, conservative politics, the silent majority, and all of that other crap. Um, in other words, conservatives still controlled after all of these 1968 uprisings. And I guess the question then becomes how long are they going to be able to stay in control? In Czechoslovakia, eventually they are going to get their revolution. 1968, eventually, you know, Nixon gets mired in Watergate and all of that. And in France, de Gaulle eventually is going to be thrown out of power. Um, and there is going to be some liberal reforms there. Okay? So that's a really big thing, and it's a whole like section of the reading is about youth and counterculture, and then how youth and counterculture actually then became movements towards like something like really big and really political, and then it was student led and student bred and all of that. Um, but like I said, it kind of has a template like the 1848 revolutions where there was some initial spirit and excitement that was behind it. I still think to this day it's the closest that America has ever been to a real revolution it was in 1968. But it didn't happen, and you know we haven't really been back since. So, um, but that's, that's it for now. I mean, there's only a handful of things that we've got left to deal with, but we'll deal with them. Uh, but let's eat some food, or I'm going to have some pizza. Can I go watch the